And welcome everybody to TNM Coaching Unplugged Podcast and Zoran Todorovic Interconnected Podcast. The space where you elevate your heart, you elevate your soul, you elevate and expand your mind to the next level of itself. The space where you can really dive into the deeper conversation around personal development, coaching, evolution of humanity, and what is near and dear to your heart. And today I have special guest. I always have special guests, but this guest is really, really, really special. You know, sometimes people show up in your life and they're like these stars that just appeared out of the sky like a comet and they just kind of dive into your life and they have this special energy around them. They're showing up as a catalyst, as evolutionary strategists, as people who are really passionate, compassionate, vulnerable, people who care about humanity, people who really, really want to see the embedderment of the human species and human race, and they inspire you. So with this guest, I have been inspired many, many, many times. His humor is amazing. His intellect is really witty. He is extremely powerful in his business acumen. He has been very, very successful in his business dealing as well. He's an example of what is possible in humanity. Giancarlo Canavessio. I love this Canavessio. <laughs> it's just... He's joining us today. So welcome, Giancarlo. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Oh, my God. With this introduction, I'm a little bit afraid that I'm not going to be, you know, keep up with expectation. <laughs> I know. You know, I do this all the time to people. I, I <laughs> the trumpet and then people are saying, oh, my God, can I really do this? But you can. You can. I ah, just... it's, a te- it's a technique. <laughs> yeah, it is a technique. <laughs> I just want to say a few more things about you and about Mango TV because you're founder and, and curator and selector in the Mango TV. And every month, Mango TV brings the new films, new podcasts, and all of these movies and podcasts are about sex, about plant medicine, about regeneration, about drugs. They're kind of controversial documentaries that you really want to share with humanity in order for us to kind of get something new, interesting, exciting, to really, really, really get us thinking. And I love that you have this courageousness around you, that you're able to produce, talk, highlight certain topics that not so many people are courageous enough to talk about. You know, for example, your documentary in 2012, The Time of Change, Neurons of Nirvana, Understanding Psychedelics Medicine, The Lottery of the Birth, that documentary in itself has made the top 10 list of the best social change documentaries, right? You know, this was something breakthrough at that moment in time that nobody else talked about. And we're going to talk about more and more about, about other documentaries, but I just want to highlight how amazing it is that you are that human being who is strong, courageous, playful, crazy enough to be able to talk to us around this topic through the documentaries. So once again, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So with that journey, what the first question that I have for you actually, what inspired you to kind of embark that journey of producing documentaries, watching documentaries, playing with that form? What was your journey into that medium, so to say? So so I was coming from from finance. You know, uh, I was an investment banker in London in the 90s and... Then I started a risk management company, and it's and it's all was all about numbers, mm-hmm. um, the way things look or feel or smell was completely out of the occasion, of the equation. So so I felt that um, I felt a calling for filmmaking for doing something more creative. Um, you know, I had a friend Fabrizio um, in New York, and he, he, we shot uh, um, a short movie. Mm-hmm. based on Truman Capote music of chameleons. There was a, one episode and he adapted that and we shot in my loft in New York and I was immediately hooked mm-hmm. because there is, there is something about playing God when you make a little short movie because you can, you can change the character, you can change the sex, you can change the age, you can change the location. You, you, you're, you're like a mastermind. And, mm-hmm. uh, and you know usually people are very you know, worry about having a movie crew in the loft. And I didn't, I didn't want them to leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was, inc- the electricity was incredible. And then I discovered documentary where you could add 
to the electricity of filmmaking, you can add the, the learning and the, if you want the documenting, the activism, the reporting. I was always been passionate about news. Um, yeah, that's 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 how it's all started. So what I'm hearing, it was like playfulness because you love the media. Yes, something really talked to you that electricity of being able to, you know, record something palpable and play God. But also you wanted to add this layer of education to it, you know, that we can learn something new about ourselves and something new about world through that medium, right? Yes, yes. And, uh, and um, you know, I met this, all this beautiful author when I arrived in New York at the end of the 90s. Um, that completely opened my horizon to other, other paradigm, you know, what, what you don't see. I was pretty much like a secular materialist, you know, investment banker from London. And, and um, I remember my girlfriend at the time um, when she was asking me, you know, how do you, this is, I'm, I'm going to really put me down now. <laughs> my, <laughs> she, she was saying, okay, but so, but how do you feel, you know? Uh, and then I remember that, you know, I had a very even limited vocabulary on, on feelings, you know, I'm tired, I'm hungry. I, and, and I, I, that for me, arriving in New York and getting to, to know this um, author like Daniel Pinchbeck and was really um, an opening of, of, of metaphysical horizon. And so that curiosity combined with this new medium of camera, uh, that, that was the, the beginning of Mangusta production. Wonderful. So Magusta production led into the Mango TV. And then in Mango TV, you know, the films that you are, you know, curating or sharing are, you know, with the big topics. So let's say with the topics of sex, for example, you, you're talking about sex. How did you get into the space of wanting to co-create and produce documentaries that are actually inspiring people to look into their sexual life, into who they are, what they are, how to relate to it? Because again, this is a topic that is not comfortable for, for people yeah. to share and explore. I mean, for, for, for monogamy, the documentary on, uh, on consensual non-monogamy, that was a very specific situation where one of my best friends, Tao Ruspoli, who's the director, mm -hmm. he, ha he, he had, like me, a, a playboy father. I mean, his, his father was a famous playboy. Dado Ruspoli was dating the most beautiful star in the world. My father also was a playboy, a little bit less successful in terms of of beauty and, uh, but, um, and, and, and we both were a little bit traumatized because they were both practicing non-consensual non-monogamy. Mm -hmm. You know, Ta Tao's father was famous. He once invited two women on a holiday with him, mm -hmm. one on the boat and one on a hotel in the islands. He was like in the Mediterranean, Capri. And so he would have a girlfriend on, on, on the boat and then he would like leave her and then go and have dinner with the other girlfriend that was in the hotel somewhere. Mm -hmm. And 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 my father once made us. Um, we were like eight or nine. We, he made us pretend to go skiing because we had to leave the house so that mm -hmm. the girlfriend he had would leave the house. So we had to pack the car with the boots and the ski and everything. And then he would go around the block. He would say hi to this girl, and she would leave. We would go around the block and come back home, and then another girlfriend would arrive. And so. Uh -huh. And so me and Tao, we were like, you know, when we heard about this movement in America called um, CNM, consensual non-monogamy, also ethical non-monogamy, we thought that makes more sense because we both saw the pain and misery that this constant lying created to our mothers and to the girlfriend, and it was, it was just not sustainable. And and so so we did, so so Tao. Um, decided to make a documentary, I raised some money, and uh, he went on the road, and, and you guys should watch it on, <laughs> on Mango.tv, Monogamish. Absolutely, Monogamish, absolutely, because again, you know, what, what is beautiful and special about you is that you're sharing your life as well, you're sharing the beginning of the conception of that documentary that kind of created from the sheer space of you being able to transform certain energies of your father and what happened in your life, what was your model, into something that will make sense or feel right to you later on in your life. And I love when people come from inside out, when you use your own, I, let's call it pain, to be able to create something with it, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So what, be, what do people tell you when they watch this uh, documentary? Do they get inspired by this? Do they get confused by, by, by the documentary? What is, the, uh, in the essence, the message that, you know, it's there for people to be inspired to see? So 
so the message is, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't propose, propose, uh, propose or push um, polyamory or non-monogamy. It's, it's, mm. it's a very personal choice, but it, it, it is an attempt to show that this concept of monogamy, it's, it's very recent. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not working and it's not natural. So it's very recent because it's only from the sixties mm -hmm. that, um, you know, consensual consen um, reciprocal monogamy it's a very recent because it's only with the you know woman liberation of the 60s that the woman imposed the men the same restriction in the history of humankind with patriarchy men with the concubine men has never been monogamous they impose monogamy on the woman to make sure that the the, the son was theirs you know the heir mm -hmm. for the inheritance for the land so reciprocal monogamy is 50 years old which is nothing in evolutionary terms. So it's very recent, it's not working in America, 60% of the of marriage end up in divorce, and it's not natural. You know, in, the, in, the, in his book, um, Sex at Dawn, Christopher Ryan spent years studying all the, the species and there is not one single species who's monogamous. People say, oh, but the penguin, the march of the penguin, they make a movie and the congre you know, like the congregation would rent theater to show how monogamous they were. And they were, but for one year. They live 25 years, these penguins. So that's not exactly lifelong monogamy. And then the swan, they mate for life, but they have sex outside of the couple. So basically, there is not one species in nature. So it's very recent. It doesn't work, and it's not natural. But yet, we take it as a default system. And even worse, we beat ourselves down if you're not good at it, you know, and, and because of the judo christian Morality, I mean, it's, it's, it's an old story on why we have this disagreement. So for me and Tao, it's important to tell the world, listen, you know, if you choose monogamy, fine, but if it's not for you, don't feel bad about it, you know? Um, so that's, that's, that's a little bit the problem. I mean, it's, it's very, very delicate. And, um, and everybody needs, you know, you really need two Buddha people. I mean, the term polyamory is a bit misleading because polyamory is when you love more than one person. Mm -hmm. Like you love two children, and that's really that's really difficult. You really need two enlightened people that really have reached a level of awareness, and that that has you know what can be a little bit more feasible. Maybe is to have primary partner, and then mm -hmm. you are allowed some flexibility that can be together, that can be separate, but where you are emotionally monogamous but sexually non-monogamous. That seems to be a little bit easier. To be mm -hmm. emotionally non-monogamous and sexually non-monogamous, it seems to be very difficult. I, I know people, but it's, it's, very, it's very hard. You know, we have 10,000 years of patriarchy, um, you know, uh, we, we have a very deep, deep neurochemistry of love as property. You know, yes. and and, and yes. sometimes and sometimes in this commitment as your mind, your your you know your mind, I'm yours in that container, mm. beautiful beautiful thing can flourish and and um, and so so it's it's really a personal journey. But you know, culture needs to be more open, and it, it is it is you know like in my podcast you can hear Zana Branglova, the professor of sexuality at NYU, who talks about. Non, non monogamy as a spectrum. Jorge Ferrer, another professor of sexuality, um, invented a term called novogamy, which mm -hmm. is like, we, you know, he thinks that, like in, in, the, in gender, now there is a um, depolarization, right? They talk about gender fluidity. Mm -hmm. He thinks that in the, in the future, what's happening, there's going to be also a depolarization between monogamous and non monogamous. There's going to be novogamous. <laughs> and, uh, wow. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Check it out. <laughs> Absolutely. But what I'm loving again about this, and thank, thank you so much for sharing that, is the conversation is open. You know, yeah. and people kind of go beyond the taboo and they begin exploring what is right for them. You mentioned this is an individual process. You are in relationship with yourself. Therefore, you're in relationship with your sexuality. You need yeah. to support, to understand yeah. what really works for you. And you're also giving people permission to for that exploration because for yeah. me this is boxed into the taboo. It's you know, we always surrounded with this limited belief system where we can, cannot do. We have guilt and shame as as yeah, the main yeah. main you know features within sexuality. So now here 
we can at least explore it. We can look yeah. into what feels right for us and what doesn't. And I love what yeah. you just said it's yeah. recently. I mean, yeah. no, let's not mention the pigment one year. I didn't know that. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> and, and- and you know, w- one thing I want to add is like you know the, the the sexual part of it. You know, I really believe that you know um, vitality and, cre- and creativity are linked to sexuality. And you know, in long term monogamous couple, you know, after 20, 30 years, if sw- if one of the two lost interest in sexuality, what is other person supposed to be, to do? You know, so I feel that you know this com- you know I, I'm, you know I don't think there's any secret, but you know. A lot of friends of mine, they completely remove sexuality from their life. You know, like old friends from, uni- from, from, from Italy. I'm not going to say their names. <laughs> they, no. they, 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 say, they say, oh, you know, I just like, you know, they just, I, I, someone, I said, but how do you deal with monogamy? And they say things like, like everybody else with food. <laughs> 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 but but I think I think it's a mistake. I think you live longer if you're if you're sexually active. I think you're like more creative and so yeah. There is the spiritual element as well of sexuality, the kundalini rising, you know, the, the vaitrantra, the people being able to tap into their powerful source of vitality, as you said, and therefore they can have more of everything in life instead of depriving themselves. Exactly. And, and since you mentioned Tantra, so this is the other um, things that I'm exploring now. We have two documentary, one that I produced called Sex to Spirit. I hope I exactly produced. And another one, which is an old one called Sex Magic. They're both about Tantra. And so that's another alternative to long life monogamy, where instead of opening up, you go deeper with this person. So you don't do these peak orgasm anymore you really use each other as a door to the divine and as a mystical experience. And that's something that can grow even after 20 years. Mm-hmm. So this is a little bit the two things I'm recommending for long-term monogamous. Either open up or go deeper with Tantra practices. That's it. Open up and go deeper. Thank you, Giancarlo, for that. <laughs> now, tackling other extraordinary topics like, like understanding psychedelic and understanding the psychedelic medicine. For you know, This is something new that nowadays it's becoming a mainstream so to say a lot more people are knowing about it but you're pioneering in that space of that understanding so tell me more how did you get into that space of understanding psychedelic understanding the medicine what was your journey in there if you want to share share a few personal things about that because it's always inspiring for people to hear about real people real life and then you know how do you see the evolution of that going forward so so my wife stephanie she already was doing ayahuasca in her 20s, 30 years ago, mm-hmm. when, she was, when she was modeling in New York. She was going to Peru already back then. So when I met her in uh, 06, mm-hmm. 05, 05, 06, um, she had a practice, um, mm-hmm. and uh, it was, she, it, she was in and out. She had a practice and also party practice. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and so she organized for me um, a, a ceremony in a, in a peniche, in a houseboat in, the, in Paris mm-hmm. with some friends of her, with this shaman from Peru. And that was my first time and it was incredible. I remember having an incredible heart opening and um, yeah, um, synesthesia, mixes of senses. And, um, and I, I, I realized that there was so that was we were just scratching the surface, mm-hmm. and and so and so it was it was a beautiful period. We you know together we decided that you know we wanted to do this. We wanted to be together, mm-hmm. and so we we started a practice. You know we had a little bit of issue to address both of us, some little addictions here and there, and mm-hmm. uh, and and together we did it. You know like from 06, maybe for for six seven years, uh, until maybe yeah I mean for maybe until 2012, 2013, we would go to Alto Paraiso in, uh, in Brazil and we would get to at least, at least a couple of retreats per year. And, you know, we, had, we did hundreds of ayahuasca ceremony. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, like you're never 100% healed, but we feel now we are healed enough. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> you're healed <laughs> enough, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so now we don't really, we don't have a practice anymore. We, we do it once in a while more as a collective experience. So that was the beginning. And then again, Daniel Pinchbeck, when I arrived in New York, you know, had wrote a book called uh, Breaking Open the Head, 
mm-hmm. and 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 on contemporary shamanism and um, mm-hmm. and so so through him and through the we met a lot of psychedelic you know psychonaut in New York mm-hmm. I become friends with Rick Dublin at Maps we mm-hmm. we become very close with Amanda Fielding at Beckley and Roland Griffith at John Hopkins and. And you know, I started to help also financing, donating for some clinical trial, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, that was the beginning. And then the documentary, and then uh, yeah. That so was the... for the people who are kind of at the beginning of this journey and, and trying to understand the deeper purpose and deeper meaning, you know, of engagement, because you shared right now, you engaged spontaneously through your wonderful wife who was already there. And you begin exploring and, and healing and transforming. What would you say are the most beneficial things that you have experienced in your life as a result of engaging in the ceremonial space or understanding the psychedelic medicine? You know, we ha- I, we had a specific um, issue to address, uh, mm-hmm. which 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 were addictions, um, and so. You know, for your listeners that, that are new to this, I would con- I would recommend one book. Which is the Michael Pollan um, book um, breaking? Um, I, I feel like saying um, say break, it whatever comes to you, and then we'll reference it in the in yeah, the, yeah. Ma- Ma- Michael Pollan, something like the science of psychedelic, uh, how to open your mind, something like that. If people Google Michael Pollan psychedelic, is a bestseller, and and Michael Pollan, you know, he did all his research as he usually does, and you know, w- with this new magnetic res- resonance machine called uh, functioning, mm-hmm. fMRI. You can see what's happening in the brain when you take these psychedelics. So DMT, psilocybin, LSD, mescaline. And what's happening is um, there is a default mode network in the brain, which is the connection of three key areas: the prefrontal cortex, the medium cortex, the thalamus, something like that. And this is, it's a hub, of dif- it's a hub for different areas of the brain. And Michael Pollan says that um, is the closest thing to your egoic armor. It's like right. the director of, um, of the orchestra of your brain. That basically what happens when you take the psychedelics, this default mode network gets subdued because it reduced the um, blood supply. The right. psychedelics, the psychedelics re- is quite, it's a little bit counterintuitive. The psychedelics reduce the blood supply in this default mode network. Mm-hmm. So, so it's like your ego gets subdued. Mm-hmm. So now that the ego is not driving you anymore, you are allowed to go behind your personality, your biography, and you can tap to all the other part, part of your brain that were subdued. You know, I explained to my 10 year old son this mm-hmm. idea of the orchestra in the brain. And then he said, oh, yes, of course, because then the, the director fall asleep, all the other head of the other department for sleep and then it's pillow fight everywhere <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, and it's right you know the creativity the patience the curiosity all these things that were that were subdued by the director of the orchestra and then the head of the other department of the brain it now that they're gone is a total anarchy you know you right. can, it's like it's like those those snowballs you know, where the, you know, you know, this, this kitsch little table snowball that you shake and all the snow goes up in the air. So basically you, in that moment of anarchy, you can rec- make new connection and, 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 and you can, and so you understand why you have this desire of numbing, you, you see behind the structure of your, of your egoic brain. It's very interesting. I recommend the book. Absolutely. And did it help you deal with your addictions? Because I know everybody's struggling with some kind of addiction, being a food, alcohol, tobacco, you know, addiction to social media, addiction to, you know, television. You know, we all had this in our yes, abs- absolutely addictive behavior. So that journey, how, how did it help you? And to what extent were you able to free yourself from, from addiction? So, you know, in... Um... During, you know, during the ceremony itself, sometimes it's, you know, it's complicated. It's, it can be a little bit disorienting and, but, but in the morning, you know, it's what they call the psychedelic glow mm-hmm. and for a few hours. And then if you keep it with diet and yoga and the right thinking, you can keep it for a few, for a few weeks, even the psychedelic glow, you have that sense of peace. You know, I used to say that I just don't have a, 
a voice in my brain. I have a committee of people commenting everything I do. This is good. This is bad. Why you did that? And then they talk about themselves, you know. And yeah. the, and the mind the mind can be can be uh, you know they say that you know the mind is a, a great servant but there's a terrible master. And I was completely enslaved by my mind. And then I needed to numb it with substance and, and other behavior. But with psychedelics, I found this peace. So even if it doesn't guarantee it, you, then you have to do the work. You know, you have to organize your life and in purpose, organize your daily, you know, your routine. And, and, and it, it, it's, not the, it's not a panacea. It's not a silver bullet that you just take yeah. once. You yeah. have to do the work. But it gives you the sense that that peace is possible. Right. And so, and then every three months you will go back and then you will go deeper and you will understand things about yourself. And then you have to, you know, what really helped me actually is coaching. You know, I told you, um, I had, I signed up to this, with this coach and she really helped in setting the goals and the purpose. That's why I think that, you know, to really have a success, successful or fulfilling or happy life, I think it's a combination of, psychotherapy and coaching you know that's for integration because you you're also saying that integration is most important and i love that you're sharing that because there's no this spiritual bypassing when we take the magic pill and immediately everything transforms in our yeah. life we all we all want that you know we we're aware of our ability to be instantaneously creating reality and i'm sure eventually we will be in a situation when we can just dream it in a second and transform ourselves but we're not there yet. So, you know, we, we, we are seeking for that speed in transformation. But I love what you're sharing with the audience that there is, this is a journey when you're taking the steps, but then you're going back into your life. And in your life, you're actually practicing and integrating and setting the goals and creating routines and everything. And then, you know, you can slowly, slowly begin unfolding. And I love what you said as well, which I 100% agree that this is never done that we all work in progress and it keeps on you know fluctuating and keep on working and growing with this instead of feeling okay now i'm done let me move to something else right yeah 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 and then this kind of brings us to the next topic that i love that you're addressing right now through your work which is the regeneration and the regeneration of, of humanity regeneration of the soil regeneration of our planet regeneration of you know the climate you know how did you get into that you know what were what kind of got you to become passionate about that part? So, so when we bought this land in Ibiza um, seven years ago, mm -hmm. uh, my, my brother uh, had used this uh, permaculture gardener and he told me, listen, you know, he's very, he's very knowledgeable, but, um, you know, he, he does what he wants. But so I was curious. So I met with Jose Ann and, uh, and I said, Jose, listen, I show him the land. I said, I bought this land. Let me build a house. And then we do the vegetable garden. And he was like, no, 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 no. You don't make the mistake everybody makes. You start the garden today. And I was like, but we have to ask for the permit. It's going to take years and years. And he said, listen, to prepare this land, we need at least three, four years. I was like, oh, my God. And so through him, I learned that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's this idea of, 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 um, of regeneration of the, of the land is um is like creating underground mm -hmm. a symphony of chemicals mm -hmm. um basically and you do this avoiding pesticide and fertilizer so you need to you need to create a, a biodiverse ecosystem of mm -hmm. plants trees and vegetables that mm -hmm. can actually help each other mm -hmm. with 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 mycelium with, with with this fungi that help the communication with with the uh, animal manure, with compost, mm -hmm. you have to take the big stones out. And Josean explained to you that the, the consequence of this biodiversity symphony is not only that you have a resilient um, farm that doesn't need pesticide or fertilizer, but you have all the macronutrients mm -hmm. that otherwise will be destroyed by the monoculture. Mm -hmm. And people don't know that yet. This quite recent science, you know, people think that oh, the gut is the second brain. But what now we're discovering with electronic microscope is that it might be the first brain. The level of complexity of the microbiota is like trillion of quadrillion of bacteria and microorganisms. It's like 10 with 32 zero. There's like 
10 times more than all the stars in the, in the, in the sky. It's an incredible number of complexity. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is that this microorganism that comes from the regenerated soil through the, pro through the produce, then um, feed your microbiota and boost your autoimmune system. You know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a coincidence that in America, that is such a huge industrial agriculture, there is like epidemic of everything, you know, of, 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 of obesity and, and heart disease and diabetes. And it's like, in America, there's like great mental health. It's because people don't eat food anymore. This idea that food is medicine is now coming, you know, in, into the mainstream, but you know, until a few years ago, I think that doctor in residence didn't didn't even have to take a a, a course in nutrition, right? And and, and um, so 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 yeah. So we 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 now with some friends we are you know in in Ibiza it's a, it's a perfect storm because there is so many abandoned land. Mm -hmm. I think only there's like in this island there's like five hundred thousand hectare of land. That only one percent is uh, farmed regeneratively. And only two percent of the food eaten in this island is produced here, mm -hmm. and there's and there's all this land that has been underused or abandoned. So it's a huge opportunity for all these talented and resourceful people in this island to make yeah. this island an example of the world for the world. You know, if if you can regenerate fifty thousand, hundred thousand hectares, you can capture the rainwater, you can change the the biosphere, you can avoid the 40 degree temperature in August, you can feed the population with nutritious food. You know, maybe in 20, 30 years, we're gonna have Ibiza to be a blue zone when there is the most hundred years old people living in Ibiza, you know? Yeah, yeah. But what you're saying is that that is something that is extremely important for us to get in relationship with right now. I think that now is the time for us to really wake up into the sense of the food is our medicine. Yeah, absolutely. Move away from processed food. food process yeah. into really yeah. understanding that you know what we put inside ourselves is you know it's so important and you know to eliminate the sickness and disease because a lot of that was created by industrial uh, production of the food correct hmm. on Giancarlo's uh, mango tv mango dot tv website you will be having a privilege to go to different sections that we kind of discussed you know today you have a section on drugs and then you have section of the documentaries there. Then you have section on sex and you have the selection of documentaries there. And then you also have a regeneration section when you have different documentaries to see there. And then also every month, you know, there is a peak of the month at the most popular ones, so the feature film. I keep on saying to people, you know, we're so tired of Netflixing and going to HBO and going to the Amazon Prime and just watching these endless streams of, of uh, series that sometimes is super in, in, inspiring and refreshing to kind of go into the space when you can find this beautiful documentary that can really get you to think, open up your perception, get you to explore different versions of yourself and really get you to learn something. Because by me watching some of the documentaries of this production, I've really learned about myself and about life. So now one last thing that we have before we wrap up for you, I know that you're big on the topic of understanding your own trauma to be able to transform. And part of the people who are listening to this podcast, they're in personal development. They come from big organizations. They come from personal development industry. There are also people who are coaches, teachers, therapists, and guides as well. And people who are curious about personal development. And we had this conversation once you and I on the life, you know, when you just stepped in into the life transmission, and you talked about importance of trauma and why we need to look into this and how can we liberate ourselves from it and what is that? So I would just like you to talk about it a little bit because I like your take on it as well. So um, a, a good framework that I resonate with is um, uh, what Gabor Mate talked about. You know, Gabor says that as humans, we have two basic needs, which is the need for attachment and a need for authenticity. Because mm -hmm. evolutionarily, you know, if, 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 you know, the, the need of attachment is obvious. We need, you know, when, when we're born, we need another year and a half before we're able to be independent and walk around. You know, we're not like a horse that day one can run away. <laughs> so we are, we, we know, we need uh, attachment to our mother. And the authenticity is because, you know, evolutionary in the savanna, we needed to trust our instinct to avoid to be eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. Mm -hmm. Gabor says that sometimes in the West, in our society, 
what happened is that you know we lose attachment mm -hmm. because our parents are just distracted because they have their own problem nothing to to do with nothing wrong with us and that co as a consequence of that detachment we lose the authenticity because we want to get this in interest back i mean that's definitely a, a happened with my father for example you know i lost my sense of authenticity because i wanted to get his attention back so i pretended to be what he wanted me to be and so that gabor says create like a neuro circuitry rupture that loss of authenticity is like a rupture that prevents your evolution and that create this traumatic um, like like a knot, like a psychological knot, mm -hmm. and 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 when when your brain is like you know very porous, like age four, five, six, seven, you internalize um, fears on you know how how that there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. um, your your parents not showing up to the to the recital at school is not because they were busy at work, but they don't love you. So as a kid. We go through all these events that make us make us doubt. Mm -hmm. You know, when we are when we are kid, we cannot process it. You know, we just internalize them. But then they, they are there, and they are. Uh, it's 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 like it's like a, new, a, a neurocircuitry resistance that that make us lose. Um, you know, which 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 create an issue with self esteem, which makes you think that we're not lovable, and and that's the traumatic event. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if you have an abusive father that, you know, wipe you with the belt, then you remember. But there's a lot of also more subtle trauma that are very pernicious, you know, just lack of being um, positive reinforced, lack of encouragement, uh, lack of presence, emotional neglect, and emotionally available parents. All this stuff in childhood mm -hmm. make you build your armor. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you hear people saying, oh, that's just my personality, just, a, just a, my neurosis, people don't change. But it's not true. We now know from neuroplasticity, from neuroscience, that you can rewire your brain. It just takes a long time. It takes a long time and it takes a lot of effort. So sometimes it's easier you know, to, to, to numb. You, know, you have that anger, that reactivity, that trigger that comes out when certain things happen. But rather than make the effort to understand that, that's not a response, that's, that's a reaction, that's a trigger to this and this and that. Um, it's easier to have a, a whiskey or, or, you know, or, or, or the numbing. Yeah. So this is a little bit the big problem, I think, in, uh, in our society. And then people are so busy, you know, people are so busy. People are, you know, people are so tired though, from work and, and, you know, it's almost, a, I hear, you know, I have good friends that are so busy. I say, listen, I, I don't have time for your documentary. I need, I, I, my brain is, I'm fried at night, you know, I don't, I, I'm cooked. I don't have the energy to understand about the brain and the consciousness and the traumatic event. And I just want the Netflix to just relax, you know, and, and, and because people, you know, I, I'm reading a book now that my friend recommended called 4,000 week, which mm -hmm. is, um, which is basically um, 4,000 week is the average age that we live. You know, it's not very much, right? Four thousand weeks, anyhow. And so it's 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 time. It's it's a book on uh, on time management, basically saying that um, you know, is that is, is that that we don't is that that is that that we 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 have we don't have time. We are time. So basically, the idea is that you know you can, you're not going to be able to optimize your time to do everything that you want to do. It's just an illusion. Basically, the idea is that you, don't, you have to learn to say no, not just to the things you're not sure you like, but you have to learn to say no, even to the things you like, in order to allow for space for the things you really like. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, you know, I, of course, I'm lucky. You know, I, I was lucky in the 90s in finance in London. You know, even monkeys would make money. <laughs> so... So of course I, I have the, the 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 luxury to be able to take time off, but you know in um, Warren Buffett says that in order to have a happy life you have to write down your twenty five objectives in life and then scratch the last twenty. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say is that people are just doing too much. You know. Absolutely. They're doing too much, and also this conversation about trauma and how they feel trauma and not being able to be fully 
uh, authentic through the space of not really, really, not really feeling that attachment uh, in, in, a, in a genuine way. We don't have time to deal with this. And that just keeps on escalating and escalating and driving people's life without us having space and time to evolve. So what we're saying to the audience right now, create space, right? Stop yes. being that busy. Yes, yes. Make sure that you create a little pocket so in your life, in your time, and you can address certain things in your life that those trauma, traumas will bring into your presence and don't neglect them. And I think that if we are wise enough to make sure that we are in relationship to what triggers us, what is our innate trauma or the micro traumas that you were talking about, and we address yeah. one by one, we tackle them, we transform them, we understand them, then we step into a completely different level of our life, which is more contentment, peace, peace, fulfillment, joy, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And then if, I don't know if we have a couple of more minutes, um, yeah. You know, uh, I really like Bre um, Brené Brown. She talks mm. about her book, Daring Greatly. Mm. She says that, you know, a lot of people are just so uncomfortable with being vulnerable. They mm -hmm. just don't like it. Because mm. again, from their insecurity, from insecurity and sense of shame, this idea of like putting themselves in a vulnerable, vulnerable position, they don't like it. But then this is a recipe for lack of growth. You know, like Brené says, you know, you have to put yourself down in the, in the arena. And then if you fail, is 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 new data. There's no failing. They're just like learning. Yeah. And, and I have friends that are terrified of, of putting themselves out there. And mm -hmm. that and that's a pity. So I would say, you know, embrace the vulnerability and 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 don't be ashamed of failing. You know, failing is it's very important. It's just new data. You know, there's no losing, they're just winning or learning. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, using absolutely, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, or you know, practice and play because we all invited here to play. But in order for us to be playful, we also need to be in relationship with ourselves. So what I love yeah. about your uh, expansive self is that you are bringing all the elements that we need to be in relationship with to be the best possible version of ourselves. This is clearly featured on Mango.tv. So Giancarlo, one last word of wisdom to leave our audience with. So, so I there's another book that I really think is very important. It's called Lost Lost Connection, John Harry, um, and he's it, it basically he's been he, he's been suffering from depression all his life, and he, mm -hmm. he tried the SSRI, and he went on a long journey to study all the clinical trial for the from from the pharmaceutical company on this SSRI on this you know um, these uh, prescription drugs that that basically close artificially your synapses so your serotonin stay in the mm -hmm. air. And it, it basically um, uh, realized that the data are really discouraging, that of, there is a lot of side effects. Anyway, he, he thinks that the real secret to be depression or um, depressive episode, you know, people think, say, oh, I'm not depressed, but every two, three months, I have a week in bed, you know? So that's also, is, it's a depressive episode. It's, it's connection, it's, it's community and connection. So the quality of your, that's why I love Ibiza so much, you know, because people really care about the, the connection with the community here. They, they, they give a lot and the, um, yeah, the quality of, of your, the quality of your connection is very important. That's the last <laughs> advice I have. <laughs> so I have to say that you not only live to your introduction, but you have exceeded your introduction. <laughs> you know, you, the, the, the amount of information we share today will take few listeners to listen in two times because we open up big topics and we gave the essence of each and every topic just for you to enjoy and to elevate. Thank you so much for coming and being with us today. All the information about Giancarlo's projects and the Mango TV is going to be referenced in the video below, also on the podcast. And we're going to also offer the Instagram pages for the Mango TV so you can follow them. It's beautiful curation there to inspire you, to inspire you to be more connected, to be more yourself, to explore parts of you that sometimes we feel a little bit shy or incompetent or not so courageous to explore. So once again, Giancarlo, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for coming. And we cannot wait to have you once again on this podcast. Thank you very much, Zoran. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.